seemingly half of my life for the last 20 years. Uh, next, uh, in uh, honor of the many uh, who have died in the earthquake in Turkey and in Syria, let us take a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, now, and now I, uh, I have to say I am not a fit person to describe uh, Turkey in its hundred years. I think that would require a Turk and one who is steeped in the country's culture. Frankly, I wouldn't want to have to talk about my own country's last hundred years. But what I can do is talk a bit about how the United States in the region perceives Turkey and how Turkey acts. Now, it's a complex subject. As many of you know, uh, my friends here from uh, uh, Iraq, both here in the north and in, from Baghdad, and uh, there are many uh, friends from Syria as well, uh, Turkey is a big uh, player, a big neighbor, a big partner, uh, uh, and not always an easy one. But uh, what are the basic uh, outlines of its policies to help us predict and work. Uh, I'll use four S words. Strategic, strong, surrounded, status quo. Strategic, strong, surrounded, and status quo to try to explain how I, in it isn't the last 20 years, it's the last 40 years, have seemingly spent half of my life dealing with Turkey. Uh, Strategic is obvious. Look at its location. Look what it's been able to do, blocking through the uh, Dardanelles and the Montreux Convention, Russian naval reinforcements, stopping flights, military flights between Syria and uh, Russia in the Ukrainian conflict. Uh, that is the kind of thing that a owner of strategic territory can do. But also, it has deep historic, economic, military and other ties in every direction, into the Balkans and further into the EU with its uh, various relationships there, uh, in the Middle East with its Ottoman legacy, and into Central uh, Asia with its religious and ethnic and linguistic ties. Uh, there's probably no other country in Eurasia other than Russia and China that meet this level of strategic criticality. In terms of strength, uh, depending upon where the economy is uh, and what the, uh, the Turks are doing with their own uh, finances, which often is not uh, very successful, uh, they're somewhere between the uh, 18th and the 14th largest economy in the world. Uh, very, very strong military. Uh, we know what it can do when it comes up against Russian aircraft. We know what it can do when it comes up against uh, uh, Assad's forces and the Iranians in northwest Syria. We know uh, it's had decades of experience fighting an insurgency against the PKK. It's militarily effective uh, in Libya. Uh, it not only has the second biggest uh, NATO military force, <clears throat> it knows how to use it, and it's an experienced force. It is involved in various NATO uh, programs, uh, from the uh, NATO nuclear deterrence to the uh, uh, deterrence against an Iranian uh, ballistic missile uh, attack uh, with very important installations in eastern Turkey. Uh, the Intellic base and other contributions to NATO are extraordinary. Uh, so. This is an unusually strong country. Uh, it generally has been stable, with the one exception of the Gulenist coup in 2016. Uh, but the significance there was it was quickly put down. Uh, and uh, it has a strong democratic tradition stretching back to 1950. Um, so uh, that strength buttresses its strategic position. But here's the downside. And Turkey A is surrounded with problems, in some degree enemies. The two biggest are a regional wannabe hegemon, Iran, and a wannabe global hegemon, Russia, with whom Turkey A has had 400 years of experience, largely uh, experience as foe 
uh, in various uh, wars, I think 13 or 14. Uh, and we could count this latest one uh, on Ukraine. So uh, it has very significant big challenges, but also it has holdovers from that period 100 years ago, uh, frictions with uh, part of the Kurdish community in Turkey, the PKK, which is now more of a uh, problem here in northern Iraq and in Syria as it is than it is in uh, Turkey. Uh, it has problems with Greece. It has had historic problems with Armenia. Now, one can say, but wait a second, these are not huge existential threats, but Turkey as a country, as a culture, thinks in 19th century terms. And its fear is not that the Greeks have a few troops on an island within sight of Turkey's biggest ports, but rather that someday there will be an alliance of Greece and some big power that will try to squeeze Turkey. That was its experience in the 19th century. And so it worries about this. Uh, this seems fantastical to most Americans when they hear this, and it's very hard to get people to believe it. But having dealt with Turkey over 40 years, I can say that Turks understand this, they believe this, and from time to time they have seen, they have seen the Assad regime back uh, Abdullah Ocalan until pressure by Turkey and with a little help from us later, uh, that problem was taken care of. They have seen Iran support uh, uh, PKK elements in Sinjar recently, uh, not far from here. Uh, and so uh, this being surrounded is real and it explains much of what Turkey does. Uh, and it also explains why the United States is not as sympathetic as it perhaps should be because we don't understand this because we've never lived like that. Who are our neighbors? We're the unsurrounded country. We have Mexico and Canada who are our trading partners and we have two big oceans. We don't have this feeling, not since we defeated the British uh, the second time in uh, 1815, of a threat on our borders. Uh, so it's hard for us to understand that, and it's kind of hard for the Europeans too, at least the Western Europeans. Um, finally, status quo. Uh, now, people will roll their eyes and say, no, Turkey has been very active uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it had, I think, a ill-advised uh, campaign to throw its support behind uh, various Muslim Brother organizations uh, in Gaza, in Egypt, uh, and elsewhere during the Arab Spring. But the important thing is this didn't work out. And Ankara has realized that and is now re-engaged very effectively with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates. And this shows the, uh, both the flexibility of foreign policy, but also it's basically a status quo country. Turkey sees itself, the people see themselves overwhelmingly as tied to Europe. Uh, they have strong European ties, not just NATO, but the uh, uh, customs union with the European Union. It has been a tremendous uh, lubricant and fuel for the Turkish economic uh, miracle as an export-driven uh, economy. Uh, there are five, six million, perhaps more, uh, ethnic Turks in Europe. They're very, very effective. Uh, as we saw in Germany, uh, Feitz's uh, partner in developing the first vaccine uh, was a small firm run by a Turkish German and a Turk, uh, uh, not far from Frankfurt. And so uh, they're big players. Turks are an important component in Europe. Uh, and there's just no other country like this. Uh, and this means that at the end of the day, Turkey stands with us as we see with Ukraine. With the exception of the United States, no country in NATO has done more for Ukraine than Turkey. On the other hand, no country has cut Russia more slack in terms of trade, continuing to purchase hydrocarbons, uh, banking system, not ex executing NATO sanctions in Turkey as well. And that leads to friction with the United States and with its NATO partners in Europe. But you have to weigh on balance what Turkey is doing on Ukraine to ensure that Ukraine remains free which for Turkey would be a geostrategic 
disaster if it fell to Russia is far more important than what it is doing with Russia. To understand that dynamic, which comes from it being surrounded, my uh, third S, uh, helps a lot in trying to decipher this country. So once again, I'll stop. Just remember, strategic, strong, surrounded, and status quo. Mr. Ambassador, um, you very clearly articulated um, these four S's. It's strategic, strong, status quo, surrounded. But, um, I mean, I was reading this um, State Department segment on the internet describing U.S.-Turkish relations, and this is a direct quote from the website. According to the U.S. State Department, it is in our interest to keep Turkey anchored to the Euro-Atlantic community, quote-unquote. Um, to me, this sounds as an implicit declaration. The United States saying, well, basically, Turkey is a rogue state. It's out of control. It's out of sync. But we're trying to anchor it and, and keep it back. Because, it, it, I mean, as you surely know, um, Turkey has been purchasing S-400 missiles from Russia. It supported Mohammed al-Mursi in Egypt. Uh, going back a little back, it was neutral during World War II. It denied access to the 4th Infantry in, in, in Division when they wanted to liberate Iraq from the Northern uh, Front. Um, Turkey has been breaching sanctions against Iran, uh, and Turkey has been ind indirectly facilitating ISIS and other fundamentalist organizations. I mean, surely for a country like the United States, which is so powerful, I and mean, why do they have, I mean, we appreciate the four S's, but it mean, it comes across as if you're being a bit far too submissive, in my opinion. Um, okay. Uh, I'll get to the substantive points in a second that you raised. They're all true, uh, and they do trouble Washington. They also all have explanations. Uh, but let's start with the State Department uh, statement, and I don't want to uh, discourage any of my former colleagues uh, with the State Department, but as one of the people who used to write these things, just tear them all up, okay? What the State Department pitches as its mission with any is to save that little country from itself and make it look like, uh, well, pick a state that a Republican or Democratic uh, 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 administration would like. Make it look like California, make it look like Texas, depending upon whether it's a Republican or a uh, Democratic administration. This is our uh, self-assumed role. We are, uh, the United States are going to keep Turkey as part of the, you know, Euro-Atlantic no, we're not. Turkey is going to do that, and it does do that. Uh, we have strains with them. But if you look at uh, this list of things you said, one of them, supporting Muisu, uh, I thought that was a mistake, but wait a second. The Obama administration supported Muisu. Uh, I think, as many of you know here, it played a major role in throwing out Mubarak uh, in 2011. And so uh, that would be the argument that uh, the Turks would make. But in terms of buying the S-400, in terms of uh, <clears throat> some of its actions along its borders, um, in terms of not allowing the United States to uh, uh, attack out of Turkey into uh, Iraq in 2003, uh, in each case, Turkey was responding to its sense of being surrounded, its sense that it has to take care of the situation on its borders. It concluded that if we went into Iraq in 2003, we could create a lot of instability. Now, in going into Iraq in 2003, uh, I think we did a service to the Iraqi people. We did a service, certainly, to the people here in the north who were uh, facing uh, uh, extraordinary pressure from the Saddam regime. But, uh, you know, we uh, created a lot of chaos in the region. Uh, we, in some respects, facilitated Iran's expansion. Uh, from the Turkish standpoint, we allowed uh, uh, more refuge for the PKK. So they had their concerns with that. Uh, and what you do is you look at what we're getting, uh, what Turkey is doing for the alliance. Again, it's plays a critical role in the anti-ballistic missile defense of NATO against Iran. It plays a critical role in uh, the nuclear and other programs that uh, uh, NATO has. And its role in Ukraine is really very, very important. 
uh, but it is hard for the United States and to some degree the Europeans to accept <clears throat> that a country is going to be 70% with you when you want it to be 100%. Uh, but what are we going to do about it? You know, we can huff and puff and hold our breath, and the country isn't going to change. It has deep strategic reasons flowing from the four S's that I just explained for acting the way it does. It's going to keep acting that way, and we make fools out of ourselves when we constantly chastise Turkey, eh? which there's a little bit of that in that State Department uh, uh, statement. <coughs> that Turks mainly shrug their shoulders and say, uh, okay, it's just boilerplate. Yes. Mr. Ambassador, you've had uh, over 50 years of experience in the U.S. Foreign Service as a, as a di distinguished diplomat. I mean, I personally feel that there are two phases of Turkey after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire within um, the last 100 years. One of them is before the fall of the Berlin Wall during the Cold War, and one comes after um, the fall of the Berlin Wall post-Cold War. It seems that during the Cold War, Turkey was more nationalist and NATO-centric, um, but after that it's becoming more assertive uh, as a regional power, it's becoming more autonomous. It has this idea of having a Turkish model, various ideals in, in which it wants to project itself in the Middle East region and um, in Eurasia. I mean, would you concur with this argument or, or do you think um, Turkey has been pretty much continuous in its actions? No, very much, uh, but I would say after the end of the Cold War in 1989, 1990, we saw much the same thing with Europe. <coughs> Europe uh, created its own currency, created its own common security and defense policy, claimed it would set up a European army, and spoke a lot about more independence from the United States. Uh, the reasons for that were, <coughs> first of all, people felt that uh, the United States might not be as present in the world. If you're a European or if you're here in Turkey or there in Turkey, uh, you're still going to sense threats, big and small. And you're going to want a 911. If the 911 doesn't answer, if the 911 is busy talking about pivoting to Asia and the last three administrations, not this one, to some degree, but certainly the last two talked a lot about pivoting to Asia, uh, you're going to be out there on your own and you're going to have a more independent foreign policy. And then somewhat hypocritically, we then in Washington say, how dare they do things without checking with us in advance? Well, uh, as I said, we keep on talking about pivoting to Asia. Now, we're not pivoting to Asia. Uh, within three kilometers of here, yesterday <clears throat> I saw <coughs> four U.S. military aircraft. Uh, we're still here in Erbil, we're still in Baghdad, we're still in Syria, we're still in, I could spend the rest of this conference talking about where we are in the Middle East, 70,000 strong, and we're not going anywhere. And we're also here diplomatically, we're here with our assistance programs. But the emphasis that we have made at the highest levels of the Chinese challenge and more recently the Ukraine challenge have made people in the region, including Turkey, nervous. And therefore, they're trying to hedge their bets. They buy missiles from Russia, and then they block Russia on their own from expanding in Libya. So on balance, where are you? On balance, we're getting a lot from Turkey in terms of maintaining stability in the region, and people here in uh, Erbil and in Iraq are getting a lot as well. Mr. Ambassador, I mean, quite clearly, uh Turkey was admitted to NATO in 1954, and I believe the West has done a great deal to integrate Turkey um, into the West. Politically, it's been included in the Council of Europe. Economically, it's been included in the OECD and the EBRD. Security-wise, it was included in NATO and the OSCE, and culturally in the Eurovision Song Contest and the European Cup. Why do you think the West has still failed to, to adopt and integrate Turkey um, into a Western mindset? Um, that's a very important point, and again, it would be better for a Turk to explain it, but nothing has hurt 
its overall relations with its home. I mean, Turkey has several homes. It feels comfortable here in the Middle East, in the Arab world, where it has been present as a leading uh, force since <clears> the <throat> 15th century, earlier for the Seljuks. It feels comfortable in Central Asia, its roots. Uh, but uh, it definitely was very hurt by the inability of Europe to take Turkey into the European Union. Now, one reason was people thought it was too poor. Well, it isn't too poor anymore. Uh, the idea of refugees from Turkey flooding Europe, you know, it's ridiculous. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, there may have been some prejudice about a major Muslim state entering the European Union. Uh, but the most important thing is the European Union hates conflict. It hates war. It has a hard time, as we're seeing right now with Ukraine, of dealing with military things. <clears throat> Individual countries can, and they work together in NATO, but as an institution, the European Union is post-modern. It's post-war. And Turkey, here in a very, as you all know, tumultuous region, just a few years ago, we had the Islamic State sweep through much of Syria, here in Syria. Uh, <clears throat> you have, again, Russia, you have Iran. Uh, these are messy situations that the Europeans didn't want to get involved in. But I think this left a real uh, mark on Turkey, and uh, it has a, a negative impact on its relations, not just with Europe, but also with the United States, because we were one of their big sponsors on entering the EU. Mr. Ambassador, I mean, as you already know, I mean, the Kurds in Turkey are working at two fronts. One of them is the legitimate political participation through the pro-Kurdish um, HDB party. They're under tremendous pressure, great restrictions. Um, Salah Hadin Demirtas is in prison. Uh, Osman Baydemir is in exile in London. Um, obviously, they have remained within the legal confines of the political process. And also, on the other hand, um, earlier on last month with the earthquakes, I think it was after the 6th of February, um, one of the PKK commanders, uh, Jamil Baig, announced that they were um, announcing a, a unilateral ceasefire and they were hoping that this would allow relief and assistance to reach all the devastated areas that were affected by the earthquake. Um, but still, based on um, what I've read, the Turkish government continued um, uh, its, its uh, attacking SDF forces in northern Syria, killing several of its commanders. Um, I mean, don't you think that uh, the Kurds in Turkey are between a rock and a hard place? They, they work politically, not reaching anything, and then when they use violence, they're accused of being terrorists, and even when they declare a ceasefire, which is obviously an olive branch, it doesn't seem that Turkey wants to um, embrace this opportunity, and it also doesn't seem that the United States supports either side to, to reach um, a peaceful conclusion. How, how would you analyze the situation? Um, well, it's complex because the Kurds in Turkey are split. Uh, Erdogan, traditionally, not in the last few years, but previously, uh, received 30 to 35 percent of the Kurdish vote, uh, second only to uh, the uh, uh, Kurdish, uh, you can call it a Kurdish party, it's basically the political wing of the PKK, uh, which is still today, it may be under a lot of legal pressure, it's also the third biggest party uh, in the parliament, and it was recently in negotiations with Erdogan's party on constitutional changes. So it has still a role. Uh, there are a lot of flaws in Turkish democracy. Part of them relate to that party. Uh, but again, uh, it's a complicated relationship <clears throat> with both the Kurds who have sympathies to the PKK and Kurds who are more conservative and have sympathies or had sympathies towards the uh, uh, the what we call the AKP of Erdogan. Now that has changed in the last few years because the AKP has formed an alliance with the National Action Party of uh, Mr. Bacheli, and that party is very negative against Kurds of all sorts, including the Kurds of uh, Northern Iraq, with whom 
uh, the Erdogan government, like previous ones, has a very close relationship. So I think it's complicated, and I think all of the actors, uh, the Kurds and the PKK, the various offshoots of the PKK, the offshoots in Syria, the offshoots in the uh, uh, Democratic Party, uh, and the Kurds who aren't associated with the uh, PKK, the Kurds here in northern Iraq, all have complicated relationships with Erdogan uh, and will continue to do that. Uh, I don't see a major move in any direction. And you're right, uh, they did announce a, um, a ceasefire. Uh, the Turks have continued to do some strikes in the northeast of Syria, also the northwest. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> they also have not done any major military operations. Mr. Ambassador, I'll ask you one last question and then I'll open the floor uh, to the participants. Um, the AKP party and um, Erdogan and his group have been in power for almost two decades now and national elections are due soon in Turkey. Apparently there's been a, a six party opposition bloc established to be able to challenge Mahapa and, uh, uh, and Akapa in, in, in the upcoming elections. I mean, how welcoming is the United States of change in Turkey, politically, I mean? Um, the official answer is the United States doesn't try to put its finger on the scales on uh, political developments inside any country, particularly democratic countries that are fellow NATO members. Uh, the reality is <clears throat> people in Washington always think about these things, in part because they don't want to look like they're supporting one side or the other. That leads to policy decisions. Uh, and sometimes uh, people will get the idea that, well, maybe we would be better if these guys stayed in office, or maybe we would be better if these guys uh, left office. Now, A, we're not very good at making that assessment. B, were even worse, <clears throat> somebody who's tried it in a few places, at actually having any impact on what happens. It really <clears throat> isn't going to <clears throat> depend upon us. The Turkish people will decide when elections are held uh, who is going to run their country, not but, us. But Mr. Ambassador, it seems that Turkey, Ankara, is still upset from the U.S.'s position in the attempted coup. Uh, of 2016, that they, see, they seem still very upset that the United States did not condemn it enough or, or, or did not um, support the, the AK party enough. So, um, so that, I mean, to me, that implies that <coughs> Washington is welcoming of change. Uh, yeah, I was <coughs> involved on the margins of that, and it wasn't an era of commission, it was an era of omission. Mm -hmm. uh, President Obama simply wanted to wait and know what was going on before reaching out. And, and that's commendable normally under those circumstances. It left the impression that we didn't care or we were rooting for the other side. And of course, Fethullah Gulen is, uh, has um, <clears throat> uh, essentially refugee status <clears throat> in the United States. Uh, this is still an issue that Ankara raises with us, my assessment is it is not at the same level as our operations in northeast Syria, which Turkey still has uh, major concerns with because of the <clears throat> potential <clears throat> impact. I think, uh, first of all, everybody or almost everybody in Turkey knows that the United States wasn't in any way behind the coup, even if Gulen was in fact in the United States. And secondly, that uh, there is no legal way we can extradite Fethullah Gulen under our extradition uh, treaty. So uh, it's an issue that will still be on the list of things when <clears throat> the Turkish Foreign Ministry does their equivalent of the, <clears throat> the State Department uh, list of things that we, they would like to see their partner to be better at. This will be included, but the, uh, I think the sting has gotten out of, gone out of that given the many other things that we are either uh, at odds about or we're working together on. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. If you don't mind, we'll take a few questions from the floor. Um, can you raise your hands? I'll take one question at a time. And those who are interested in asking Ambassador Jeffrey a question, please introduce yourselves. So, sir, please, yes. Yeah. 
ask a question and please introduce yourself. Yes, you. Yeah. أنا اسمي شلال قدو عضو الائتلاف الوطني السوري سؤالي لسعادة السفير الآن تركيا تود أن تطبع العلاقات مع النظام السوري برأيكم سعادة السفير هل من شأن هذا التطبيع أن يؤدي إلى تسريع العملية السياسية في سوريا؟ إذا تقدر تعيد السؤال تعيد السؤال بس نعم السؤال تركيا تحاول الآن أن تبني علاقات أو تتصالح مع النظام السوري برأيكم هل هذه المصالحة إذا تمت من شأنها أن تسرع العملية السياسية في سوريا أو تؤخرها وشكرا مستر أمباستر جن يو أنا اسمي أنا اسمي شلال قدو شلال قدو عضو المجلس الوطني الكردي في سوريا وعضو الائتلاف الوطني السوري المعارض. Okay. I think that the Turkish government should uh, answer that question. My observation of not only the efforts that Turkey may be doing, but also of the Emiratis, the Jordanians, and others, has been uh, what does it bring? Aside from a civil war that is terrible, half the population of Syria has been driven from their homes, are either refugees, many of them in Turkey, many in Jordan, uh, many of them uh, in areas not under Assad's control in the northwest and the northeast. Um, this conflict has created a whole series of geostrategic problems. Uh, you have an enclave supported by the U.S. and the coalition with an offshoot of the PKK with 30 percent of the uh, territory and maybe 10 percent more of the population in the northeast. You have Hayatir al-Sham in the northwest. You have Turkish forces on the ground. You have Israeli Air Force in the air. You have Iranian long-range rocket and missile systems. You have the continued presence of the Islamic State. You have the chemical weapons program that Assad still maintains and is uh, itching to use again. These are all big issues. Uh, many of them concern Turkey, us, the Arab League, uh, Israel, and the Europeans. And if people can talk to Assad and get Assad to do anything about any of them, that's all to the better. I'm very skeptical. I believe Turkey is skeptical too. Uh, one reason I think that uh, it has taken these steps, first of all, it wanted to ensure that the uh, uh, crossing from Turkey, a humanitarian crossing into uh, Idlib stayed open uh, under the UN resolution last January, and fortunately it did. Uh, secondly, uh, it's an election issue because the opposition has been arguing that uh, uh, the Turkish government should engage with uh, Damascus. So uh, they can try. I, I follow closely the UN's efforts with Damascus for years. We have seen no progress on any of the underlying issues in Syria from the Assad government. If Erdogan can get that, uh, alam vasalam. But uh, I'm skeptical, and I don't think the Turks are really very uh, optimistic at this point. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much. We were really delighted and honored to have you back in Kurdistan, and we consider you uh, a in friend. In Iraq, in Iraq. In Iraqi Kurdistan. And um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, there's so many more questions. We could have gone on for hours and hours. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you, thank and you. thank you all.